And I'm very happy to introduce my good friend, Mike Heckenberger. Mike is uh, an archaeologist. He's in the Department of Anthropology. He's kind of an archaeologist plus because he does a lot of other kinds of things. Um, Mike, I'm going to show you later after he leaves some pictures of the geoglyphs in Acre that we visited together 10 Nine, years ago. Yeah, 2000 or something like that. 18 years ago. <laughs> Quite a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and he has been working for many years in the Shingu region and is part of a whole generation of people who have overturned our understanding of pre Columbian Amazonia. Um, and he's doing really interesting work. Um, so I'm going to basically turn it over to Mike. Um, let me just. Do I change slides with this? Yeah. I'll yeah. Just put this down. Uh, well, thank you very much, Marianne, for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for taking the class. I have to say, before I get started, um, you can't imagine what a remarkable opportunity this is for you guys to have Marianne Schmink teaching this class, uh, which has always been remarkable, and to have Betty Loisel teaching it together. This is a kind of a once in a lifetime educational opportunity. I should be in the class, I think. Uh, I, uh, you guys read a few things that cover uh, some different ground in the things that I work with. As Marianne said, um, that has been primarily trying to uh, rethink, reconfigure the way we think about indigenous histories in the Amazon. And obviously, in a place like the Amazon, where there isn't much in the way of written records in many places, and people don't write down their own histories, that has been um, archaeology, which is my primary forte in the field, um, has been very important in filling in some of the gaps, and trying to figure out what it is Amazonian societies may have been like uh, in the past, and uh, what happened to them. Uh, when I first started working there in the early 1990s, I was interested to look at, and I worked right down in this area here. Uh, it's currently green, it's a forest, but uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but one of the things that was really prominent on the landscape across the Americas at that time was the so-called death hypothesis, the idea uh, that potentially upwards of 90% of Native American populations had uh, been wiped out within 100 years of European contact. That was from the best known areas. Now, obviously, that's a high estimate, but we knew that uh, there was a tremendous, a catastrophic depopulation event very quickly after European contact. But at that time, nobody knew what was up in the Amazon. So to some degree, the idea that what you see in the present, ethnographic type people, small tribal organizations, that's the way it's always been. Um, and that's not uncommon across the globe when Western science, Western philosophy approaches other unknown areas of the globe, they tend to be demoted down the scale as if they don't have a history rather than not. So that was what I set out to do in um, the 1990s, and we discovered that yes, indeed, the Amazon forest didn't insulate indigenous people from that, um, and that they had gone through a similar, very catastrophic history. And that changes then the way we look at everything about the Amazon. Everything from its biodiversity and its composition to the effects of uh, colonialism to the place of indigenous people in contemporary political systems. And another thing before, I roll into the slides is that's been critical about this research and I've been working in the same area for about 25 years is working with the indigenous people themselves on their history. Um, and so you're going to get a little bit of that throughout it, but I wanted to put this slide up here to start. This is kind of on most people's radar screens, the Amazon tipping point. Um, there was an important short comment uh, in uh, early 2018 that put it in these very blunt terms that the Amazon may be on the cusp of the tipping point. And for about 10 years, people have been playing around with simulations about what the Amazon might look like if things continue as they are or um, potentially get worse. And you can see here, this is not your typical image of 
uh, the Amazon forest. Uh, yellow, brown, orange is not good. That means it may be something else. And the projection here, and this is from Dan Nepstead and his colleagues, and that's almost 10 years ago. Um, this is 2030. So by the time you guys are cycling through your first postdocs or assistant professorships, that may be what the Amazon looks like. And uh, that means some very bad things, obviously. But for me, working with indigenous people, this could be an existential crisis for them. These types of changes could uh, ruin a society that managed to survive 500 years of us, which is in itself a very remarkable achievement. And uh, here are the people that I work with. Uh, these are slides of the Kwikuru. Um, who are one of the groups that occupy the Upper Shingu. There's one of their traditional houses. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But these are the people uh, that I'm talking about when I say they may really um, be suffering even worse consequences than losing, as we estimate, um, or going from 50 to 100,000 people 500 years ago to 500 people in 1950. They won that battle. They're still there. They're alive and well, as you can see here. These are all um, photographs from over the past 10 years. But what's happening today in this region, the Amazon tipping point, maybe what tips them over the edge then as a viable and intact traditional indigenous culture. And so this brings me to this point. As Marianne man, I'm a, or, or mentioned, I'm a little bit of an amphibian. Um, I've lived about two and a half years of my life in the Kwikuru village. Uh, I'm very uh, close with the Kwikuru and work very closely, particularly with the primary chief of Kukaka Kwikuru. Um, but it's taken me a long time to figure out what exactly it is that I do. And recently, well, not too long ago, I realized that really what I do is archaeology of the future. Um, and that sounds like an unusual thing. But what it is, is to say, when you see something like that, well, you might not want to ground yourself too tightly into the details of whether a certain type of pre-Columbian pottery changed to this type or another, or details of the past. You might want to say, how do we use archaeology, indigenous history, and these things to combat what's a problem on everybody's radar screen? And What's been problematic in the Amazon for so long is what I call a presentist view. Everybody looks at the forest, they look at the animals, they look at the indigenous people as if that's the way the Amazon was for all times and all places. And then in comes the tidal wave of development and climate change and you know the, the bad things that are happening. But if you want to devise strategies that are going to affect the best change in relation to certain problems that we recognize. And that may be um, poverty amongst um, vulnerable groups, including indigenous people. That might be climate change. That might be trying to effectuate um, changes in the face of rapid deforestation and development. Uh, it's nice to know what happened in the past. It gives you a little bit of a rudder as you look through the present. And you can say, okay, this is how things happened in the past. This is what's worked, including what works for them. Because remember, I work in an indigenous area, so it really doesn't matter what scientists or even potentially what policymakers think. That, that is their indigenous land. And if <laughs> they want to do something or not, that's entirely up to them. But what we can do is we can articulate what's meaningful and works well for them, what they embrace, including the problems, but also participation in the methods. Uh, what's the future that they want to see? And so you don't really excavate the archaeology of the future with a particular technique. And you don't necessarily go at it with a particular theoretical bent. Here's the question I want to ask. This is what everybody accepts is the important question. And we, it, to some degree, the question has to be generated um, on site, in place. So I threw a couple of things up here. Garden Cities is one of them. Does anybody remember where the idea of Garden Cities came from? Not from me, but originally. No, it was a man named Ebenezer Howard, who back in 1902 published a treatise on London. He was a Londoner. And he said, this sucks. Um, this is not going to work. 
he's really the father of urban sustainability. In some respects, he's one of the primary fathers of the green movement. But he said, hey, we've got all the techniques, we've got you know social energy, and we've got things, if we bring that to bear, we can design better futures. And so why don't we get on with that? He was a futurologist, he was a utopian. They came up with an idea called Garden Cities. It turned into a movement. They actually built the things. They were. It's a remarkable thing. But he said, in place of a city of 300,000 people, like London, why don't we make 30 towns of 30,000 people and fold nature and fold productivity systems um, into it and keep people within, he actually had a measurement, 600 meters of nature. Um, and it was just a remarkable thing. And I came across this strangely while doing work with um, people in downtown Sao Paulo, a very different um, kind of angle on the, pros um, on the prospect. They actually, there's a neighborhood in Sao Paulo called Jardines that was in part inspired <laughs> by Ebenezer Howard's thing. So I found it through that and Jane Jacobs and some of the, the classic literature on urban settings like Sao Paulo. And I said, oh my God. If Ebenezer Howard knew about the stuff I work on in the Upper Shingu, it would have been a chapter in his book. It's like, these are the garden cities of yesterday. But one thing that's important, we can talk about the details of what makes it like that or not, the road systems, the transportation, the multi-centric networks of communities. But what I love about Ebenezer Howard was garden cities of tomorrow. He's like, what do we do to move something to a place in the future where we want to see less crime, where we want to see people who have connection with nature, where we want to reduce pollution? That was his, um, his image. These are from the science article that I think you, um, that you read. It's about, uh, you know, if you want an analog to downtown Manhattan and the pre-Columbian past, there it is in the upper Shingu, not in the Central Valley of Mexico or on the coast of Peru. Um, they just didn't build pyramids and use plowed animals and things like that. It was a very different way to organize very large populations with um, very sophisticated technologies to interact with their environment. And I'll get to that point a little bit, how they managed to work with nature as opposed to against nature and why that provides solutions for population growth, economic growth, energy sector type factors in this area. But here again, archaeology is of the future. The reason I'm looking at uh, tomorrow rather than today is the history of the area. This is about when I started working there, and this is 2005. This is an image from the Instituto Socioambiental, who's also been working in this area since the early 1990s. And so you can see, man, they, they've got a uh, that's a nasty yoke um, already, and that's just 2005. That's pre-extreme drought southern Amazon. I don't know, you'll, you may hear about that down the road. I'll mention it again. But it's one of the reasons that this area may not be forest is what happened after 2005, and that nature uh, may have a real volume in these areas. These are the kind of core galactic clusters or garden cities. There's a ceremonial hub site, two major... Uh, and like when I say major, about 50 hectares or 15 times the size of the contemporary village. Two major walled settlements and then two secondary, still quite large walled settlements, and they form this cluster. So where today there's one village, uh, in the past they had these five core villages and then multiple satellites. Um, and you can see Boy, what a remarkable thing they've managed to pull off here. Um, this is, you know, this makes an urban planner drool. <laughs> uh, and if you kind of wonder, it's like, look at the, the ritual center here. There's the plaza. So when you do the, you know, the geometry, it's kind of like, well, why isn't there something? Well, actually, there is. There's a little plaza right at the end of the formal path. And you can also notice all their roads are oriented the same direction. And you can see the same directionality, the same patterns carry forward in the microscopic version of those big galactic towns in the contemporary village. Sorry, is the, maybe I haven't seen it's on the other side of the river? Yes. So oh, this is a, a thank you for bringing that up because here is an important thing, and I'll mention this probably better in relationship to this slide. 
these two primary settlements are connected overland. And then the secondary ones are over a river. So they're like weaving together these different places. They become kind of a, a, a very uh, planned out socio-ecological network. Now, it seems like that if you only see one, but as we've worked in, in the southern area now, same group of people, we start to see the same pattern emerging. It's like, man, what are they up to? Boy, Ebenezer Howard would have been proud. Um, <laughs> honest to God, these are, these are absolutely remarkable phenomena. This is a Google Earth image from 2003, and we started to pick these things up. What we are, what they are, we don't know. Yes? So I see there the river and this uh, kind of gray thing. It's the, uh, yeah, this is floodplain. This is unforested floodplain right here. And everything that's kind of oh. green is forest. Oh. But then you're talking about what sort of look like terraces or something? Yes, there? absolutely. Can you and see those lines he's talking about? These are oh. also the areas that have recently burned. There's a relationship between the pre-Columbian features and contemporary burning, which is what's happened in the past 10 years. The place is going up in flames. Um, kind of California scale <laughs> difference in how important wildfire and, and, and forest fire is in this area. So we're not really sure. That's what we're down there at the moment to try and figure out. And it's an interesting problem for both us and the Quihudu themselves. So it's a great way to galvanize around, let's have a better look at this stuff. And at the same time that we're applying our techniques, they're working alongside us and figuring out, you know, why that's meaningful. What is uh, causing these fires? Is it lightning? Uh, it's actually indigenous burning practices that in the past um, have worked just fine. But now, because the basin, and I'll talk about it perhaps, in a moment, but it, just in case I don't, this is an important point. The Upper Shingu Basin, it's a, it's a very clear, distinctive basin. It's, it's, it's surrounded on most areas by upland areas that are less forested because it's already into the central Amazonian um, kind of vegetation. So you take a basin, you deforest everything around the core area, what, what's gonna happen? Well, water's gonna evaporate hard very, very hard. And so unless you got a lot of water coming into the system, ultimately that means the basin is going to dry out. That's what I mean about an existential crisis. They, they at the very least, may not be um, surrounded by so much forest that they depend on um, in a very short time. Add to that the fact that at least in this part of the world, the climate has gotten dramatically warmer, but particularly drier. Um, roughly, well, about five out of the past 10 years have been classified as extreme droughts. It's kind of remarkable. So it's become the new norm. Um, and that's a very tragic thing. And that's why, um, uh, Joe Lloyd, uh, it's, uh, this region is so, uh, ancient. So, Chita, this is, um, this is what's because called the Potosi Plateau. And it's on the, uh, the very northern edge of the central Brazilian kind of plateau, the big um, central Brazilian highlands. And so it's a unique area. It's a, it's a kind of, it's been scoured out from erosion along the north banks. And the Guyana Shield and the Amazon Shield, the Brazilian Shield, are, are this big ancient mountain range. And it's scoured it out. So it's, it is um, a a fairly unique ecological area. And then out of the basin itself, the Shingu, um, because there's there's bedrock to the north of it, so it creates a bottleneck. All the rivers kind of backed up and eroded, and that's why it became this. this because we have some areas that are so dry here to the Black River, in the Amazons, and I have come across some uh, communities that they, they talk about fire or without uh, someone put fire or use into Lightning the and there's other yeah. causes where in fact I've, we have a fingerprint um, thing of those banded forests in the upper Shingu and so the question is is that a reflection of how land use was outside of a pre-Columbian village or is it that the fact that a lightning strike hit 
and just kind of radiated out from that. That's the problem we're currently working with, and it's a thorny problem. It's going to take you know a tremendous amount of sampling, not the kind of sampling that you oftentimes see when people want to make claims about the Amazonian past. It's different than going out and collecting three samples and you know kind of once over lightly and then extrapolating from that. This is a big problem in Amazonian studies. This disconnect between small plots and between small scale sampling sections and then very disparate extrapolations, and then you connect that with Low resolution satellite imagery, and you know, out comes a model. Well, there's a there's a you know skull to the thigh bone problem um, here if you're not able to kind of you know do something that scalarly operationalizes why three samples. That worked when nobody lived there and it was one big happy natural forest. It doesn't work when we deal with these highly complex anthropogenic landscapes. So we got to get in there and and, and really hammer hammer it out um, and that's exciting. Here is by the way the uh, results of a forest fire in 2016. It came, you can see the headwaters of this big lake, Tafanunu, uh, and the fire because it dries out seasonally just shot right up this uh, this headwater area. Well that's kind of neat. Um, when I first flew over it, it was about a year ago, uh, look at that and that and that, and I'll show you uh, that, and that, and that. This is something that natural river channels generally don't do. They don't stop and do a 90 degree angle. Um, so what it turns out is, looks like that whole area was a fish farming system, um, which is key. It also helps to manage not only the fisheries, but things like forest fire and stuff like this. These are potentially adaptations. And here are people using similar features. That's a fishing weir that was built in 1993 when I first lived there. Here's a woman um, using what was an artificial pond. You may remember that next to those big walled villages. Um, fishing in it today. These practices make sense to them because they invented them. They don't remember the scale that the pre-Columbian groups did it. But boy, there's an avenue to say, hey, wait, what if we scale these things up? Because here's a little factoid um, about these guys. They appear about uh, 800 years ago, or at the tail end of what was the driest period in South America for the past previous 5,000 years, right? So all of a sudden, there was this pulse, um, it's called the medieval warming period. And we know that things pretty certainly got warmer and particularly drier in this area as well. Um, so it's interesting that these banded features, these big fisheries and things like that. And by the way, the roads, if you talk to the forest fire folks, that's exactly what you wanna do if you wanna control fires that can get out of control. And so that whole partitioning of the landscape, this is a feature. We can figure out if during medieval warm times that there was drier conditions, these were the responses, they worked. Well, hey, you know, there's good news. Maybe we can do something um, to affect change there. Um, and here's just a shot of those bands. Um, they're very, very complex. There's a lot going on here. I'm pretty convinced there's, you know, there's a very clear anthropogenic um, footprint that's being represented here, but they also have this effect of um, what happens with low intensity fires, cold fires, which is hap what happens under tropical forests, uh, is they go big in the day and they go low at night. And so you get this radial pattern, but very rarely do you see it just so perfectly oriented to um, the, the settlements. And one of the things, and I show you this photograph of this house, this house is made almost entirely of one species of wood. It's called Pindaiba Gifolia Pequena in Portuguese, Shilopia. Um, and there's a couple hundred in this. And so if you multiply that by the 25 houses in the contemporary village, you get a certain number. If you multiply that by the fact that the pre-Columbian villages were 
50 times as big, and there was four of them, and they were much more densely settled. All of a sudden, um, the rough estimate that I came up with is their demand every decade for Pindaiva was 50,000 trees. And this is a factor that hasn't come into play in terms of how people have changed the Amazon forest. They're mainly interested in the food practices, what types of fruits they eat, what types of things they plant, what they deforest for them. The industrial crops, um, and in a civilization, uh, which is what I consider it, um, that doesn't have stone or metal or any of those things and is 100% essentially organic, um, the demand for industrial plants is so huge that they probably were deforesting more very selectively for tree crops and then they could fit their plant crops into what? They don't clear the land permanently. Immediately forest is managed and regrown and exactly as they convert forest to forest, not forest to farmland. That's an interesting concept as well in the contemporary world we live in. That's also the house of, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the collaboration, the Pikuru and the, um, you know, get you to know and at least slightly love um, them as well. This is a project that we're doing in the town just outside. So it's about 100 kilometers to the right of that slide you see there. That's the edge of the park. You can see the indigenous village in the background. Um, and so very stark contrast. And the work we've been doing recently on mapping the cultural heritage sites and trying to look more particularly at these things that are important, like what happened in climate change in the past, what's up with forest fires and how do we deal with those? You know, How do we potentially increase local productivity of things like fisheries? Because they need resources too. And so, hey, rather than import a tank, why not just you know, use what granddad built and it works very well. And, but we established this, it's called the Casa da Cultura um, with the local indigenous association. And we decided not just to build a stone structure on the house and put up a plaque, but to actually <laughs> create a village in town. And it's remarkable, you know, Conorana, it must be about 50,000 people. Um, it's amazing how many of them uh, have never seen an indigenous village, even though they're just a couple of hundred kilometers away. And in the Quicudo and others are in town all the time. So the idea is to create this point of connect connectivity. They're bringing the game to us. Um, and this has also been an interesting experiment on who wants to hear that message and how much. And we, we've gone through an absolute political roller coaster on this just in terms of the changing mayors and changing political tastes across, you know, from top to bottom related to Brazilian political parties. And um, this, by the way, is not a particularly user friendly moment. Uh, <laughs> For, for certain types of uh, things that we do. But anyway, this is based, um, collaboration with indigenous people is based first and foremost on one thing, trust. Native American people, no matter where you find them, whether it's Alaska or down in Terra del, del Fuego, they have a very natural distrust for what happens in the non-indigenous world and how that potentially impacts them. And I think they're completely justified in that. And so it takes a long time. You have to work very closely with them. Um, this is my colleague, Bruna Franchetto. She's a linguist, and Carlos Fausto, who's an ethnographer. Um, and we're doing this, uh, this new mapping program where we're using WebGIS or SmartGIS um, to put the resources, the tools, directly in the hands of folks in the Kikuru. And so they can do essentially real-time mapping. And we have connectivity with the scientific network. So if somebody says, hey, man, boy, we need you know so-and-so in here now to help us figure something out, um, ready to roll. Um, here we are doing uh, the GIS workshops. Um, this is my colleague, Weatherby Dorshaw at Puente Institute. And he and I have a um, hopefully a large project to try and bring this to indigenous groups, first across the upper Shingu and then um, you know, across a much broader area of the southern Amazon. And we do have, um, essentially, uh, with their help, a commitment to be able to get licenses for all of this neat software and the ability to create portals and almost as many indigenous groups as want to sign on board. Um, we're looking for somebody that may want to buy the computers and you know, the other things for that, but you know, hey, 
we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction and there is support because we want to deal with stuff like this. This is a forest fire. Dude, that's 19, that's 2016. That's one forest fire. Look at how huge that area is. And you can see there's overlapping ones. And this is where the problem comes. So the reason that some of this overlap happened is this past fires, is this medieval warming period fires. And they've kind of stacked up and created this, this landscape. Um, and what happened to that in the past? It looked like just basically homogenous forest 25 years ago. Um, now it's changed radically. So are there perhaps, you know, techniques uh, to be looked at here? Once again, our fish farming. Yes. Sorry, the area there, like the topography is pretty flat. Oh yeah, there. very, very flat. Flat, flat, flat. Okay, so back again. I thought when I would give you um, for, you know, the, the, to helping you meet the Kwikudu a little bit more was a festival that I was at in June, and we invited uh, um, people who are friends of the Kwikudu um, of various ilks to uh, not only come and you know talk up some of the things that we're doing together, but to participate. This is a very also it's very common um, many traditional groups, but certainly Native Americans in this part of the world they like to have a social engagement with people before getting on to business, like, hey, who might want to help us with our cultural center or with this project to, um, to figure out what's up with forest fire. And again, you know, it's just based on uh, a lot of connectivity. The uh, Indigenous Association, who, is, who all this work is done with, um, and for to some degree, uh, is there. So I'm just going to run through these fairly quickly. Um, it's kind of cool what I did this summer, my summer field trip. And this is a package of slides that was um, specifically uh, I put together to send to um, Native American communities that they have been working with here in the United States, who they invited to come and participate and um, in this case, the Pequot from Connecticut, uh, turns out that their ceremonies were exactly the same. Makes sense up in Connecticut, it's beautiful in the summertime. You don't want to have a ritual in the wintertime, and so that makes sense. So this was, to some degree, I just robbed this from a kind of, you know, hey, check out, you know, what we were up to. Um, so here is uh, the Hagaka. There's Chief Fukaka and his two uh, brothers uh, who are, um, the owners of the ceremony, the principal chief. Uh, Fuka Khan um, doesn't normally wear Western clothing. He is in mourning. They just last week um, uh, buried in, in their most sacred ritual called Kwaru, uh, his uncle. And because he's in mourning, he has to wear Western clothes. It's an interesting thing, but you know, that's why. And that's, uh, that t-shirt looks good. So, you know, when, when uh, about uh, two years ago and then again this year, we had a visit where I had Afuka Ka and the president of the association. This is his son, Abunagi, and Takuma is the president of the association. Come to the U.S. and we toured around and talked to some folks about, you know, uh, about things that they were doing. We also had, I had uh, his grandson, Asusu, who just left last week, he was with us all last semester, um, learning English because he needs to learn English because the Kikuru needs somebody to learn English so that they can go and visit their friends in the U.S. Um, as well. And here also, uh, myself and Carlos Fausto, we toured with them on these trips. And so um, it's kind of just a greeting uh, from folks. Uh, Bruno Morais from the Museo Gelgi, who is working with us on the GIS. Hopefully, he'll be here. Here we are coming into town, uh, Shivanshi bus lines, and these are uh, actual Shivanshi indigenous people uh, ahead of us, just to give you an idea, um, amber waves of whether it's corn or sorghum or particularly soy, um, very popular in this area. Um, here's the local town of Kanarana, where we're building the cultural center. We were watching... Uh, I've got what was it? it was one of the uh, World Cup games there and uh, kind of remarkable. There's where, where the structure is. Uh, a year later, everything's grown up. We're just about to thatch it. Um, we just put the uh, 
the floor and the roof and everything on this. So exciting, it's moving forward. This is uh, what we're doing half the time when we're in Conorana talking to, uh, in this case, a Pedrero, a uh, 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 bricklayer. Um, here we are headed off to the village in the, uh, in the single engine. Um, there are the, you know, the kind of pastoral landscapes just outside of the town of Conorana. And you can see this is what they mean when they say Amazonian deforestation. This is what it has become. This is already in the area that would be just all tropical forest. And then you come into the park and you saw that boundary and it's like, oh my God, it's just awful forest. Um, and I have this big breath. Here we are coming into the village. Here's the chief with the mandatory distribution of small candies for the children. They're cooking up fish for the invited communities who are coming in to participate in the ritual behind the chief's house. That's his brother, Itzana. Getting settled in. Here is manioc uh, broth. Fish and manioc are the primary staples, really seems like it always has been. And, uh, and then here is the initiation of the agaka. It's a spear throwing ritual. They invite another community in or two communities and they throw spears at each other. They use an atlatl or a throwing board. People used to hunt caribou with that 8,000 years ago. It kind of fell out of disuse most places in the world. But they use it ritually in these ritualized warfare um, because the Kwikuru and Shingu people are very peaceful people. They don't generally do go actually to war, but uh, um, have this ritualized version. There is normally a, a flute house out in the middle of the plaza, and they're about to move the village um, just flip it over uh, and create a new one. And so it's not uh, currently there. And here they are documenting themselves, the ritual. They have a remarkable documentation program, Takuma, and though it's called the Kwikuru um, Cinema Collective, have done remarkable award-winning films. They're representing um, their lives and the things that are affecting them directly. And uh, this is just just amazing to watch for me. In 1992, when I went there, there wasn't a light bulb. There was no running water. Uh, most of the community didn't speak Portuguese at all. And uh, they very rarely got out to town and were just stepping up. And through their education programs, partnerships that they've developed, uh, you know, they're, they're ready. Um, this is just an absolutely remarkable achievement in their documentation of their cultural life ways, um, such as the Hagaka ritual. And here it goes through the night. Um, they're throwing comments at their brothers-in-law uh, here, not entirely kind comments sometimes in um, effective war. And here we are ending up with, you know, our discussion, which is always, this is absolutely a collective thing. Um, so nothing really happens without us talking about it first. So we're kind of talking about here is a footprint of the cultural center and what are some of the plans. Here is that circular structure now finished. Here's the, um, the traditional structure. We've got some things down in this nature preserve. There's a river there. And then we're, we're working on this future Shingu Museum project uh, there so that they have a place with all of the infrastructure they need to store all of their documentation, to store um, you know, the materials uh, that support, in our case, the scientific research and the networks that we're trying to create around uh, cultural heritage mapping. Here is that um, younger chief that you saw sitting next to a Fukaika before um, hurt his hand, but uh, he is talking about the ways, you know, that the Kukuru um, want this to move forward. And so that's my marching orders to some degree is uh, to hear them. So here uh, now, um, now that you've, you've seen the Kukuru and, and some of the historical background, let's get on to the, the question at hand, which is, you know, look at these guys. Green is good. Again, everything that isn't green is bad. Um, 
<laughs> really for everybody, but certainly for the Kikudu. So you can see, my God, talk about low-hanging fruit. I mean, this is tragic. It's right in the gut. And this is the basin. So remember, the basin is drying up. So maybe this is the Kayapo lands and other indigenous groups in what's called the Shingu Corridor, the lighter green or conservation units. And the Shingu Corridor is, you know, I've heard tell the largest socio-biological um, preserve on the planet, tropical forest preserve on the planet. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> did you hear last week there was a meeting in Bogota with um, indigenous people from nine countries talking about a triple A corridor, Andes, Amazon, Atlantic? Oh, nice. Boy, didn't that be wonderful. Yeah, so I think this map kind of shows how you can imagine something. Like yeah, our work, you know, what we're focused on, and I'll talk to you um, in just a moment about what I call hope spots and why I think the whole radar screen of what people are doing to save the Amazon needs to change from environmental hotspots to socio-ecological hope spots. Now, the reason I say that is this. This is the state that I work in, Mato Grosso. If any of you are familiar with it, it was um, at much of the time I was working there, the governor of the state, uh, my Glido Maji, had a very um, forward um, plan for agricultural and pastoral development in, um, in Mato Grosso. And so you didn't see, um, there's not a lot of conservation units here. So if you're looking for southern transitional Amazon forest, now southern transitional Amazon forest is off a lot of people's radar screen. You know why? It's not very biodiverse. Not enough fuzzies and trees and things that we think are most important to focus on. It is low in biodiversity. That's wrong. That's just fundamentally wrong because people are using a definition of biodiversity based on species richness as opposed to fully understanding the genetics, or in this case particularly, functional biodiversity. What is functional biodiversity? biodiversity that operates at an ecosystemic level, and it means about the functionality of systems like forests, and wetlands, and things like that. Well, here's the deal with the Southern Amazonian Transitional Forest. Not only is it a fundamentally different province than the evergreen rainforests farther north, everywhere that we know of where there's forest is anthropogenic, at least partially. What is that anthropogenic impact? You've seen it roads and impoundments and waterways and potentially ways of using the landscape in very systematic ways that result in abandoned forests. Roadways, connectivity, the Acre geoglyphs. That not only has a big impact on functional biodiversity, it means it created it. And this area is absolutely, as far as we know in terms of functional biodiversity, the most diverse area of the Amazon. But Amazon tipping point may go down unless we do something to preserve this, which means partnerships with indigenous people, which means getting indigenous people in a seat or at a table with us, not behind us or alongside of us, but sitting there with us in terms of what do we do in these hope spots. And here's the hope spot slide again, just to show you in this area, the so-called arc of deforestation, or more recently, arc of fire, um, you don't have big conservation units to depend on. It's really the full, uh, the initial tip, because it's going to go almost certainly in this direction and then cascade across the Amazon if that full tipping event scenario um, came to play. Well, who's bearing the brunt of that tsunami? Um, these are the indigenous areas. And look over here. Those are some of the plots um, where people get their information about the composition of the forest, whether it's homogeneous, whether it's hypodominance, um, hyperdominance, you, you, you probably, or will probably run across some of this in the things that you read. Uh, there's not a lot of studies from these indigenous areas. Indigenous people are seen as hard to work with. Giving them veto powers means you may not be able to do it. They're not very, um, well articulated in larger groups, and they're highly variable. That's what makes them beauty of being indigenous. Um, they're indigenous, they're indigenous to a place and a culture, and those sometimes disagree. And so it has been seen, and it has been, in many respects, a bit of a stumbling block to people going in and working in 
in the southern Amazon, the last remaining standing area is the forest. Well, that's what I think is so remarkably changing at the moment. And what's changing is the indigenous people themselves, their interest in developing these relationships themselves, as opposed to somebody coming down and saying, okay, well, do you mind if I come in, maybe doing a free and prior informed consent, actually sitting indigenous people down at the table and say, what should we do together? Free and prior informed consent is necessarily subsumed within that process because they co-generate it. And so this is where I think um, we stand the most to gain in um, contemporary things. And you saw we're working on, uh, yeah, okay. Um, we're working on getting this part of the overall corridor kind of set up with these handheld mapping units, getting the interrelationship with the scientific network the indigenous people can contact as well, which then hopefully, and this is the biohistorical diversity, the Anuadu anthropological that I think you read, um, spreading that up and down the Shingu. These, the, the indigenous folks that I've worked with are when they're motivated and willing they learn the technology so rapidly. And when they are liberated to use those technologies independently or directly in partnership with us, they can go out and map an area that, you know, I'm sorry, I've met a lot of scientists over the years, including those who live in Brazil, and very, very few of them like field work as much as I do. Um, in fact, many of them are rarely seen two weeks here, two weeks there. It's not gonna solve much. These folks who can do it 24 seven, and they know where all the places are, uh, we could potentially look at setting up a, a mapping and monitoring network across this entire area that then becomes a socio-ecological observatory, right? With the connectivity that they can, they can interact with people in that network um, that are important. Two, for instance, we met at a conference in um, of Esri, the GIS folks in San Diego, um, some folks who work with Esri Fire and also the president of the Fire Chiefs Association of the US, they were very interested in things like these NASA images. There's fire as it normally happens in the Shingu because they burn the savanna areas along rivers. Well, this is what happens when the forests get too dry, they just blow out of control. Yeah. Uh, Mike, um, for your article, um, I found out about the Shingo Corridor uh, project, and uh, basically the social environmental diversity uh, Shingo Corridor, like a big coalition of different NGOs. Well, uh, and, and small so far. Uh, yeah, and indigenous, a lot of indigenous groups. I'm just curious to see how that's working, and and how the different uh, knowledge being generated through this uh, cultural lands, cultural landscape and the land, the polities knowledge is being incorporated into the decision making process. Well, here's the deal with, with that. We started out, that was a project, um, the paper that you read was a project that I did with um, Stephen Schwartzman of the Environmental Defense Fund, and we were working with um, Andre Villas Boas and folks at ESA. Um, we sent a proposal to NSF, they cut the program the next year. And so that, that kind of stalled. And while we're very motivated to, um, to expand that, and we're in the current phase of expanding, We've decided actually to do it in a more indigenous way, which is not to just design something up here and then just you know drop it into place. With the participation of, of partners like the Institute of Sociabiental, who've been working across this entire area for a couple of decades, we can do that. But another way to approach it, what we really focused on, is uh, this. We're going to just show how it's done. In the Kwikuru, we've created the ICOX portal, which remember ICOX is the Indigenous Association, they control the portal. Every scientist who wants to use our data has to go through the portal to get it. Um, so, you know, once again, hey, if you're asking them, you know, free prior informed consent is an essential part of the program. And here's the deal, they want to see the best science applied to helping their grandchildren go into the next generation. Um, the only thing is, is in the final analysis, it is their land, their patrimony, and their right to make those decisions and then call people. They've always been very, very friendly and brotherly um, to me, and I don't see a problem here. Here's the chief working with the handheld collector. This is directly linked into the overall web GIS. We can 
synchronize it. I won't go into all the detail. Here's his younger brother using that. Um, and here is kind of where uh, we imagine this might potentially go. Um, here is the Klikudu village. We started um, there. We break this into sub-networks that are integrated and connected through this really remarkable place of, um, I've always been very impressed, I've been a couple times to the Esri user conference in San Diego, and um, you know, this the connectivity of what they call the science of where, how you could draw different players, and it's relatively simple technology, and you can get different participa participants participating in it and parsing up, you know, what potentially goes out into the world. And there's just a kind of a better idea of some of the places um, that we may, you know, want to engage in. You know, these are from the streets of Sao Paulo. Those are Kayapo uh, guys. There's, there's Kwikudu living in Sao Paulo now. Um, you know, that's part of the equation. This is Megadon uh, Kayapo, uh, who I just saw a couple of weeks ago. Here is Carlos and Fine at the graphic form. I haven't met these guys yet, but they toured around uh, the Shingu, and maybe they'd be willing to, you know, sign on to the network to say, hey, you know, we need some help. We need some attention here. We're not exactly sure whether it's in the part of, of supporting through resources, mutual projects, or kind of mapping on different participants to certain problems to get the best benefit. Here is Steve Schwartzman, David Yanomami. There's, a, there's Nigel Smith and Augusto Oyuela from the UF. Um, my friend Susanna Hecht and Bruno Franchetto and my brother uh, Fukaka. But this gives you some idea. This is, you can see, pedagogies of hope. This lines up with this notion of archaeologies of the future. Um, when you look at those simulations that see the Amazon turning into, you know, just a pumpkin, uh, honestly, and it's terrifying, and it, it really is, it was quite sobering. Um, at the conference a couple of weeks ago, the International Society of Ethnobiology, which is the 30th anniversary one they held in Belang, there was massive indigenous participation and tremendous energy about things like our, what I call Shingu Indigenous Network um, project. Uh, it, um, yeah, things uh, certainly are in motion to start mapping out. Well, where is it we want to go with something like a, a different version of the Amazon, an anthropogenic Amazon? What does that mean? Well, an anthropogenic Amazon for me means that these people we're working with, that is uh, not only changes the way we look at the Amazon forest, but it changes the way we look and interact with indigenous people um, and put them on the radar screen. If they were dynamic in the past, uh, we might expect they'd be dynamic in the future. And one of the stumbling blocks with many people is this, this idea that indigenous people are very traditional and very different in their thoughts and very different, kind of potentially the alter ego of Western knowledge systems. Well, some of that may be true, although it's it's starting to change now that they have committed education programs in the Pikudu village. They haven't given up their rituals, but they're learning about us. They want to learn about us. But one of the most uh, critical things is they want to overcome that kind of divide um, and create partnerships. And they want, for me, not that I represent them or that I understand like they do um, something that they're doing. We do have an inherent trust, and so they're willing for me to represent in some instances, but they want to know what I can do to help them in uh, some of their initiatives. And that's enough of that. Thank you. I actually that okay. got pushed off before, so. Okay, so we have plenty of time. So, um, so actually, I have two questions. One with the map where you showed like indigenous lands, public lands, all of that. You said that if it's not green, it's not good. But I was curious, like, what do the public lands like? What are they used for? Are they protected? Are they not? Um, you mean um, on these, this map? These yeah. mosaics here. Yeah, so like the orange, like what is what is the orange? Well, I don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure what the orange represents um, up in this area. It's probably natural. Some of it, at least, is natural forest and um, 
and state or municipal level set asides. That I'm not sure about. Um, I have actually done a little bit of archaeology here and here and here, but um, haven't worked there very extensively. In this area here, I can tell you in a nutshell, um, and why I say orange is bad, it's agro-pastoral development. Um, and this is an area, this is a transitional ecological area between a part of, um, of the tropical forest in Brazil that isn't closed, dense, very high canopy tropical forest. The forests in, um, on the central Brazilian plateau range from really savanna lands, very open woodlands, scrubby uh, forest, which is called Cerradão, um, to, you know, relatively large expanses of forest along rivers and in some other patches. So it's this very mosaic landscape, but it's absolutely, it's radically different across the entire area of central, central Brazil than the evergreen, uh, moist, and fully humid forests of, uh, of the Amazon, per se. Here is this band right between them. We just expect that just the edge zone um, that it would be slightly different, but what it turns out, in part because of the geology um, and the geomorphological systems, uh, and in part because of climate factors in that area, very, very pronounced dry season, for instance, um, and because of this human footprint, um, it's a radically different ecological province. You, you, it's, it, you can't treat it as kind of like the Sahara or kind of like the Amazon. And this mix area, which has made it uninteresting, by the way, um, for many people interested in, in biodiversity conservation, environmental hotspots, it's been off the radar screen. Um, but it is a unique province. Uh, and it is uniquely threatened. And as you can see, uh, we're, we also, we had a wonderful conference actually in June in, in uh, Rio Branco on cultural patrimony. Um, it was sponsored by the federal uh, university there. And there was about maybe 30 of us there who all worked across this area, but particularly in Acre, um, about these uh, monumental features that you've read about. And you're gonna talk a little bit more about, but you know, there's 500 of them. They're everywhere. And what's up with that? Uh, was it not forest and then people built monuments in this area because climate was different, forest was different? You, you may have seen, I'm not sure. You can't build those things when there's a standing forest. No, you have, something's gotta happen. It's either gotta be open or people have deforested. Uh, and so one thing is absolutely certain. It's like I tell people, if you find a potsherd under a tree, it's not natural. That's just, it's, you know, just bank on that. So look for potsherds and black earth and you'll get a handle um, and, you know, but sometimes in the small class sampling or the occasional um, subsurface sampling, you know, people don't take long enough to really kind of figure that out. Um, and if they brought just one indigenous participant, they'd pick that stuff up in a heartbeat and they could at least kind of figure out how much of it is something, how much of it is something else. Um, but I got far off of your point. Yeah, uh, he's got another question. Yeah, this one will be quicker. I was just curious with the map that shows like general deforestation, if you've come across a map that combines that and then potentially like oil spills or oil extraction. Um, because the map that you showed of the Amazonian region, like it makes Peru, for example, look pretty green. But if you were to superimpose like black in the rivers, for example, like showing oil. Well, here's the, I, I don't want to, you know, when I say that, that the Western Amazon has been privileged, particularly as a, as a biodiversity hotspot mm -hmm. because of species richness, it is absolutely in no way, shape, or form saying, oh, let's get you know, these problems here in Mato Grosso are worse than those problems over yeah. there. Like I said, I was just at Acre. The problems over there are pretty harsh. And, you know, there was a Purina and other indigenous groups there. They were very happy to hear about their history. They were concerned about, you know, deforestation and political change and, and, and disempowerment, the very same issue. So one of the interesting things, how do we get those people talking to those people, talking to those people, talking to those people, in a way, that they can self-mobilize and feel comfortable about it. If we say, okay, all you guys, your communication has to be tied through Grinter Hall, um, it puts a, a little bit of a barrier there. Um, and so 
part of this is getting them to self-organize at a more than local level and putting the tools into their hands that they have actual um, ownership or control over. And then the other part is how do we stack up a scientific network that runs parallel to that, that respects that, but like me, takes their marching orders from something that emerges out of indigenous interests, um, but also not only enables them to contact the best scientists, but the best scientists to come in and say, listen, I think we really need to know this. Can we do it? Right? And that's absolutely critical um, because for anybody who wants to work in indigenous areas in Brazil, um, here's a news flash, gear up for, you know, two or maybe more years of waiting for permits and everything to, you know, fall into place. And this is not um, in, in the least bit of criticism. It's just the way that the system is set up and much of it to put protections into place that actually aren't as needed if the indigenous groups are self-representing themselves in a certain way. And to some degree then hire me or invite me to come down and work on their specific projects. And the, the projects that I'm talking about, uh, fire, the uh, effects of desiccation um, and drying out on their livelihoods, on empowerment and connectivity with the national community like the cultural center, you name it, um, they're not hard to get mutual support for. You just say, hey, climate change is a problem. And both sides of the aisle, as it were, both sides of the ontological divide, uh, actually step up and say, yeah, yeah, it'd be really nice to know more and be able to do more about those kind of things. And I think that's why I, I love the concept of hope spots, because it draws our attention to the fact there's a tremendous amount of energy and resources there to push back on something like an Amazon tipping point. I think they hit your hand. No, no, I was, no okay. so, um, I was think that this area is overlapping the indigenous land and national park of Xingu. It's true. So it's a conservation unit also. Which? This area that you... The Xingu yeah, park? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh no, this is the territory indigenous of Xingu. It's, it's the oldest indigenous, indigenous park in, in Brazil. The two people, uh, Orlando and Claudio Villas Boas, who um, initially, originally designed it, were nominated twice for a Nobel Peace Prize. That is an indigenous area. And while um, conservation is not off the radar screen, um, it's not a conservation unit. It automatically or de facto becomes a conservation unit. And there are issues such as changes um, in, uh, in the law that have happened recently about opening up indigenous lands for people to do you know, commercial and um, using Western technologies, um, as well as uh, other things that align the issues of conservation and indigenous people. Um, but actually that particular area, the Upper Shingu, even though it is the crown jewel or has been, of Brazilian indigenism in the past is um, by many people seem to be a hard place to work because they have turned many people away who wanted to work there, who wanted to do uh, their work there, but I'm not an easy person to work with. And the fact that they keep inviting me back and welcoming, welcoming me into their homes um, demonstrates that it's not that there is an absolute impediment there. It's just how do these things get lined up? And with the Shinkawanas, um, ever since I've known them, but certainly today, the principal issue is they want to have self-determination for what's happening in their land. Not that they want to prevent scientists from trying to wrap their head up, even if it's meant to come up with a simulation of the entire Amazon basin. Um, and this is the, the place we're at at the moment, is the sharing of information and hopes, if you will, um, and designing problems and projects around it. Mike, first, I, I always get so inspired when I listen to you talk. I'm, I'm thinking about how the people are thinking towards the future, like 20 years from now, 30, 50 years from now, and, and if there's a shared vision, and I'm thinking about the use of the land, 
things like that. Is absolutely. And then my second question is sort of about governance now, in in terms of uh, how decisions are made by the Kukuro and, and land use. Well, the the Shiguano is is, and it always has been since pre-Columbian times, is multi, you know, kind of group thing. It's really quite remarkable and. and how ind individual groups or small clusters um, maintain their independence. They never existed under a capital, um, but uh, they organize at a regional scale. They've always been organized at a regional scale. Um, and in, in my experience working with the Kwikuru, which is one of you know about a dozen related groups, um, sometimes when the Kwikuru are on board or want something or promoting something, um, another chief, almost because that's the way their indigenous politics works, is going to say, no, no, can't happen. Um, and I've seen this, you know, what happens is, is you get kind of coalitions that emerge around a certain theme and different players um, are in place. But our next workshop, you saw the photographs of the one we had in the Potsy. Um, we also we already have a half a dozen of the other groups signed on because they want the same thing to happen there, and so we'll start the ICOX is the Kikuru Association portal. We'll have a separate portal and a separate portal. They control the information themselves, and then they can take with it uh, where it goes. And by changing that that kind of authority structure, and puts them more in the driving seat. And when you get the actual results, and these guys are amazing, these collectors, I mean, you know, the, the, the information is just unbelievable. And because it's, it's theirs, uh, they, they're ready. Um, they're ready to mobilize and orient in a way that kind of gets over what, what you might, it, it's almost a conundrum or a paradox of indigenous peoples. At what point do you stop really being indigenous if you're going to get involved in something that's global or even you know regional? Um, but uh, this is this is one of the things we're working in. Again, I'm using that snowballing snowballing model rather than us come up with a design and get big federal funding and some other funding for it. Let's start something really small. Call the people who know us and love us best in from other communities to look at it. Have them bring it out. Then the next tier comes in. And if they like it, it takes hold. And then we try and align, you know, our resources, including our ability um, to to finance and support and provide the technical assistance um, to stand behind this. Uh, this is what I mean. You know, it can then grow exponentially across the Singu corridor. Um, into these other indigenous areas across the southern Amazon, or perhaps something more. And obviously it's experimental, it's hard to say, 